Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Foothill College, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week was born in Chicago, where his earliest exposure to technology consisted of helping his father repair cars and taking TVs apart. Attending Olive Harvey City College and Southern Illinois University in the late 60s, and active in politics, he was the first student to be appointed to the State Board of Education. Out of school, he began working for Sperry Univac, where he instituted their first online parts inventory. Next, as a PSR for IBM, he worked on an alphabet soup of OS's and telecom products. From IBM, he moved to Sycor, a startup which built what was, in retrospect, one of the earliest personal computers. In the mid-70s, at Continental National Assurance Corporation, he was instrumental in building a 5,000 terminal network. In 1980, he began working for the Federal Reserve Bank, where he architected networks which became components of a 50,000 terminal network. Then, at Apple Computer, he designed an X25 network for the campus, as well as evangelizing their foray into IBM connectivity. Our guest is currently a senior customer support engineer for Connect Incorporated, where he performs technical support for both PC and Macintosh-based products. And now it's my pleasure to work welcome, <laughs> welcome a telecommunications analyst specializing in IBM connectivity, Clifford Williams, to our program. Hello, Cliff, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. Hi, Sherman. Thanks for inviting me. Well, you're certainly welcome. So, how did you get started in computers? Well, uh, after leaving college, I went to work for Sperry Univac in their national parts warehouse in mm -hmm. uh, Elk Grove, Illinois, suburb of Chicago. And the uh, thing that intrigued me was that the parts that they listed for their engineers to use in uh, repairing their various products was not inventoried in a computer. It was uh, kept uh, on sh sheets strewn about, and mm -hmm. uh, we actually had to have scooters to go around the large warehouse, it's more than a mile long. So it only took me a couple of weeks to figure out that we should be able to apply uh, the computer to uh, keeping the inventory uh, in a So, I mean, was the in inventory manner. on paper, or did people just take the scooters paper. around and look and try and figure out? It was a combination were? of both. It depends on who put the uh, parts up. I see. Uh, and so you convinced uh, a computer company to use computers in their business. Right, internally to help uh, better organize their business. And it resulted in a, an increase in productivity, and it made uh, our job of servicing the engineer's request for parts a lot easier. Well, that's pretty creative. I mean, you know, teach a computer company to use computers. So um, next, well, not next, but uh, soon after that, you worked for IBM, right? Right. IBM was my first real formal introduction to... Uh, the computer industry. Now you had to, you were a PSR, and of course IBM's all alphabet soup to me, so I mean what is a PSR and how many products did you have to be familiar with? And well I started with them as a CE, a customer engineer, actually repairing uh, the hardware. And uh, from there I progressed to a PSR, which is a program systems representative. And in general he's in charge of a customer's account with respect to the software and the hardware, mm -hmm. coordinating the installation, maintenance, and um, troubleshooting, documentation of problems, right. and really taking requests for customized software and other features. And then uh, moved on, or? Well, the, uh, the base that the PSRs, PSRs at that time worked from was they were familiar now, with all of the operating systems. Now, all what is a PSR again? Program Systems Representative. Okay and uh, he coordinates the software installation in a given customer's account, mm -hmm. upgrades, uh, ordering of uh, new software, uh, upgrades to existing software, installation, right. helps coordinate training, troubleshooting, uh, any problems. So that uh, means you like pick one operating system or one piece of an operating system, be an expert at that, and, and then whenever a customer has a problem with that, they direct them to you? Well, at that time, IBM only had five, six, or seven operating systems, so PSRs were trained on the entire operating system product line, uh, access methods, uh, database, and that case was IMS, CICS, so we were trained on the gamut of products. So seven operating systems. 
at that time. And uh, yeah, at that time, that's, that's a lot of code. And uh, other products too, or just just operating systems? All of the software products in general. Uh, since then, uh, since the mid-70s, IBM has phased out the PSR's uh, role, as you can probably determine. Uh, they've increased the number of products that they have dramatically and split their lines uh, along more marketing-oriented uh, terms. So PSR's couldn't possibly be trained on all the products that IBM has now, and they've gone to a SE or a system engineer orientation. I see, I see. So they did, they they did segment it some, somewhat. Right. And uh, at that time, though, you had to be familiar with about how many products, you think? Oh, uh, for, uh, easily four or five hundred, uh, not intimate. The uh, IBM philosophy at that time was very structured in that uh, any products introduced were introduced in a framework where they could be supported. Uh, diagnostic, standard diagnostics could be used to diagnose problems or uh, malfunctions, uh, much as you do in the hardware environment. Right, right. Well, you know, IBM's always been a giant. Now, uh, from IBM, I guess you went to a startup, or at least a small company, Sycor, is that right? Right. Sycor at that time uh, was about two or three years old, uh, started by a gentleman by the name of Sam Irvin, a professor at uh, Michigan. He and a couple of his graduate students in a garage, uh, which is a very familiar story out here in the valley, yeah, yeah. Uh, put together a device that uh, they actually termed a uh, remote emulation station and uh, it actually consisted of a small nine inch CRT, two uh, cassette drives, audio cassette drives, mm -hmm. and a keyboard with a back plane that uh, had removable cards. Um, all of, oh, I don't know, probably 100K of RAM. It had uh, a processor in it? It, it had a separate uh, card that housed the processor and uh, even, uh, it was really multi-processor in design. Uh, there were other processors. Probably was what, uh, well, about what year was this? This was uh, 70, I think I joined in 75, 76. So mid 70s, so he must have designed this thing in 73 or so. Yeah, the early 70s, very early on. Yeah, well that's, you know, that's pretty early. And so, I mean, it had all the hardware components of a personal computer. It did, and, they know, didn't I mean, I, I know Sycor because I just happened to remember, well, I grew up in Illinois, so I probably heard it there, but, I, you know, they didn't invent the personal computer. No, that wasn't his aim. Uh, the main targets were businesses that had uh, IBM mainframes and they needed remote entry of data. This way the operators could work at the station during the day and spool the data to the cassette tapes. Then uh, insert a cassette tape with 2780 or uh, 2790 RJE emulation and then connect at night remotely with the mainframe and dump the information. So, so this was a matter of, of cost reduction or at least a more economic way to build an RJE or uh, yes, a terminal. Yes, it was a lot cheaper than you the sort of IBM RJE. Build a simulation or an emulation of a terminal and use a processor. Right. Okay, well, that's too bad. You know, I, I had a friend uh, in Illinois too, uh, Jeff Roloff, named, well, that's his name, and he had a company named Central Data. And I remember he was working for another company called HAL Devices. And it, he uh, he also had well he had the idea for the personal computer but I, you know he kept telling me that you know well why don't we get a computer and we'll get a keyboard and a, you know maybe some kind of storage device you know a, a cassette unit or a, or a disk drive and uh, I tried to tell him no that's not a computer you know a computer is a box that computes those things are peripherals see but he you know perspective but I he think got to be changed. a millionaire I think by the time he was 21 so. really yeah I would have made the cover of uh, electronics magazine even then. So, I guess uh, also you worked for the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, right? Which is, I mean, that seems really impressive to me. Well, it was a very interesting uh, organization to be a part of. The Federal Reserve Bank in the uh, really late 70s, early 80s, uh, 1980 when I joined, um, had designed a SNA network to run on top of a packet switch network, a private packet switch network, which they plan to procure, implement, and maintain on their own. So uh, the Chicago Federal Reserve was given that task, and I became a part of that group. Wow. And uh, so I've always been curious. I mean, how are EFTs uh, actually done? I mean, is it, I mean what's, what's the data there? How is it shipped? Uh, Electronic funds transfer is, uh, is itself not an intricate process. It's staged. That is to say, an individual um, establishes a checking account at a bank. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that bank, uh, in, in general, most banks, with the exclusion of savings and loans, are a member of the Federal Reserve uh, Organization. That is to say, they have uh, uh, a constituent relationship right. with the Federal Reserve. And, um, they basically have an account. The Federal Reserve is often referred to as the bank's bank. Right, okay. So when you have a checking account, say, at your local bank and you're traveling, you write a check, the organization that takes your check deposits it at their bank, which comprises a second bank that's a member of the Federal Reserve's organization. They process it and they send it to the local Federal Reserve that they're a member of. That Federal Reserve then does a transfer to the Federal Reserve of the home uh, uh, mm -hmm. office where your bank is located. Well, I mean, th does that go through like standard telephone lines or does it go through uh, uh, no, microwaves? No, the Federal Reserve has, uh, for the paper check itself, they actually have uh, a rather intricate courier system, a private courier system that they use to but transport. That's, a, that's a, something that they check later, that's a verification? Right, that occurs usually two to three days after the transaction has electronically been uh, but, switched. I mean, do they use somebody else's network? Or? No, they have a private network, uh, both the local Federal Reserves here in uh, California, the Federal Reserve Bank mm -hmm. of San Francisco has a local network that connects with B of A or Bank of the West and organizations of that sort. And uh, the New York Federal Reserve has a local network that connects it with its banks. And then there's a Federal Reserve network that interconnects all so, of the Federal Reserve head offices. So that, are those packet networks then? Like Currently, uh, it's a packet, an X.25 packet switch network oh. that's privately owned by the Federal Reserve. Well, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's, you uh, know what uh, form the data is in those packets and stuff? Well, uh, <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not that uh, current. I with see. Well, maybe we shouldn't go into that anyway. Okay, well, in a few minutes, I guess you're going to tell us, uh, or actually demonstrate a few of your products that, that you're uh, working with right now. But uh, right now, watch this message. John Fitzgerald Kennedy do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the Presidency of the United States. The office of the Presidency of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. The Constitution, the words we live by. Time to teach a new way Maybe then they'll listen To what you have to say The power of teaching The world won't get no better If we're just The power to wake up young minds The power to wake up the world Teachers have that power Reach for the power, teach I'm Edward James Olmos and we're recruiting new teachers Call 1-800-45-TEACH